We're talking about measuring diversity here. We have one main point that we're focusing on with some guidance to help us out. All right, we know that diversity is the full range of living things in a geographic area. And in order to quantify how diverse an ecosystem is, ecologists need a scale or some measure to work with, right? Since there are so many different factors at play um, that can play a role in diversifying a community, we have to use many different measures, right? We have to consider a lot of different things. The four we're gonna talk about today are species richness, relative abundance, percentage cover and percentage frequency. And we'll also talk briefly about Simpson's diversity index. Now, in order to measure these qualities in an ecosystem, sampling an ecosystem must be done, right? It's got to be done carefully and in a measured way. So sampling techniques used uh, may include quadrat quadrats and transects, right? We might have seen these throughout our junior years of science, and these techniques are going to be discussed a little bit later. So the estimates of these quantities are only as good as the samples taken. For example, um, pref you know, preferably you'd use a large area, right? More is better than less in this situation. And the method must be unbiased. So you don't just go, oh, I see a lot of plants here. I'm going to place my quadrat here. It must be done potentially in a systematic or even a, uh, a random chance way. So random number generator, things like that. If we talk about species richness, this is a tally of how many uh, unique species are present. So it's a real simple count. Now, if we have a look at this community here, um, our, our first gut instinct is to go and count how many of each species there are. But species richness just says, well, the species richness of this community is five. There are five unique species here. So the larger the sample, the more species you'd expect to find. Now we use Mananix diversity index to calculate that and it takes on board the number of different species and the total number of organisms present. Uh, there are so many other different indices that do similar jobs as well, not just Mananix. So interestingly though, it doesn't take into consideration how many of each species, uh, nor how they're distributed. Now in this example, both communities have four different types of trees in the area, if you look very closely, but because species richness is all we're talking about, it doesn't actually take into consideration how many of each of these trees are, so it doesn't really matter. So it's possible for one species to completely dominate an area, but they both have the same richness, okay? They both have four, but you can see here that there is so many more of that one population of tree. So in order to rectify this, we can count relative abundance. Now, relative abundance is also known as species evenness. I'm going to use them interchangeably. And it's a measure of the number of individuals in relation to the total number of species in the area. So while, again, we have a situation where both populations has five as species richness, you can really clearly see that the red stars are more, um, you know, taking over that area if you could consider this a community of uh, organisms. So we can see that that species is dominating. Now, in an area that has good species evenness, there are similarities between the numbers of organisms in each species. Uh, but, you know, sometimes counting individual plants, for example, is a little bit of a logistical challenge. Now, in an area with good species uh, evenness here, we can see that we've got all 25s in this community, whereas, again, we have this uh, organism dominating the area. Uh, it's important to know the clear difference between species richness and evenness, which, you know, and why each of them plays their own part in describing biodiversity. Really important, again, when we talk about it, it's really hard to uh, logistically count every single tiny blade of grass or every single plant in that situation. So we get around that by counting percentage cover. Now, percentage cover is an estimate of the percentage of the quadrats you've sampled in which the species appears, right? So essentially it's is it there or is it not? Um, you know, might be talking about that grass example again, you know, is that grass or this green stuff here, the clover, um, and we can see that it's covering approximate amounts there. So it's going to give us a relative abundance and influence how much coverage, that's why it's called percentage cover, right? Um, the leaf cover in a rainforest, for example, might be counted, but you know, we're talking shadows of trees over other organisms. Um, so percentage cover, when you add it all up, it might actually be more than 100% because of that overlap in vertical layers. To estimate percentage cover, a quadrat has to be broken down into small sections and it represents a certain percentage of the total area. So for example, you might break a one meter by one meter quadrat down into um, centimeter size, you know, so you might have 100 along that way, 100 along that way. Um, you might break it down into more manageable amounts. You might just break it down into 100 so that you know that every uh, box that is being covered is 1%. Um, basically, it's an estimation of how much area the species is being covered and you can monitor that so you might be able to very clearly see uh, changes over time. 
Now percentage frequency is sometimes a better measure, right? A species can take up a huge area and the percentage cover can be too large to estimate in just one single quadrat. Um, so we use percentage frequency. In this case, what we're doing is finding the proportion of quadrats uh, that were sampled that actually contain the species. Again, is it there or is it not? So it's measuring the percentage frequency across the entire set of samples. Now, it might be really important to do this, uh, say one quadrat contains 80% of the grass, you know, it's dominated by one grass species, but this might be the only quadrat that you actually see that grass in. And it wouldn't really be representative of the rest of the um, ecosystem or the area. If we have sampled the quadrats with the stars in them, we've sampled 10 um, and we can then go and count and say, well, the tree is really only appearing in one of those 10, but I can see that they're throughout the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, they're appearing in eight uh, out of the 100 that are there, so about 8%. And if we actually said, well, one out of the 10 here is about 10%, we're getting an approximate estimation of, of the abundance. All right, Simpson's diversity, uh, you know, is one index, just one of many, where we try and take on board all of the different things in biodiversity. Now, Simpson's diversity index takes on richness and abundance, or the evenness measure, okay? It was created to take into consideration both of those things, um, and it's just one measure. There are so many more indices, and there's even another Simpson's, right? This is what it looks like. There is also Simpson's reciprocal, which does not have this one subtract, and we'll talk about that in class. Now, if we break down the formula, we are taking into, into consideration every population count of each species present, as well as the total number of organisms. And uh, Simpson's diversity index ranges on a scale from zero to one, right? Zero being absolutely no diversity, a monoculture like, say, in farmland, whereas it can be infinite, right? One is infinite diversity, and we'll talk more about that in the coming lessons. So here is what we have covered in this one.